Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Barbell CEO Podcast. Today, we're going to go into the mailbag. We're going to reach deep into questions that I've gotten from viewers on YouTube, questions on Instagram, as well as people just writing in uh, via email through the website. So again, this is a mailbag session. We're going to cover a lot of things from programming to workout tips to how to build more muscle, how to use different techniques for beginners in advance. A lot of different questions, and I want to jump in because this you know, we have a lot of good things to get through here. It's going to kind of be all over the place in terms of topic today, um, which I think will be fun. So hope you guys enjoy this episode. First, I want to remind you guys that this episode was brought to you, this one today, by 10,000 Training CC. I do all these guys here. I love their apparel. So if you guys are looking for workout pants, workout shorts, I really like just a lot of their leisure wear, whether it's their, like this is the recovery sweatshirt. They have hoodies, pants, you name it, they have it. But Really what I like about 10,000 is a couple of things. First is that uh, their whole line was produced for kind of the athletic, active lifestyle person in mind. Um, but it's also tested not just on people, you know, who are, you know, just need general use out of it, but ex-military, right? They're putting people through the tests in it, athletes. So you know that when you purchase something, not only does it fit great for an athletic build, it allows you to move freely. It also is going to be durable. So it's going to be worth your money. Uh, I exclusively train in them. I live in them. I'm wearing all of their stuff right now. Um, so I love them. I've been with them now for a couple of years. So if you guys are in the lookout for some quality workout gear or just kind of all purpose gear, I kind of would call it. I mean, I wear it fishing. I wear it outdoors. I wear it as base layers. Uh, I wear it around the house, whatever. Check out 10,000. Dot cc you can use the code the barbell ceo save some cash on, on all your orders there but we're going to go in today to the mailbag session so like i said i have kind of an array of questions here and we're going to jump into the first one uh, and the first one it comes from jedi two billion from youtube that's nine zeros two billion jedi two billion um how do you use supersets drop sets and monster sets in your hypertrophy programs. And this question came off of a video that I put up. I was doing, I mean, maybe this is back in like COVID era. I was, you know, I had limited access to dumbbells. I had 30 pound dumbbells in my basement. I was just wanting, you know, bigger shoulders. At the time I was doing a lot of like boxing and Muay Thai training. So I was getting a lot of like repetition based work um, and getting a lot of that with my shoulders. And actually personally, I felt a lot of good growth in my shoulders from boxing and swinging around the, you know, the pound gloves there. So. Uh, that was great, but in this example, I was doing basically a 100 rep workout. Um, again, it was not based on anything. I just was doing a lot of volume with the 30. So basically, I just picked a number with my weight. I said, I'm going to do 100. Uh, I'm just going to chip away at them. I had a massive pump. It was great, right? So that was kind of like a monster set. I just uh, picked a rep target, and I trained. And obviously, my rest periods, uh, sometimes with that, I'll just, you know, keep my rest period shorter so I can hit, you know, sets of 10 to 15 to 20, or maybe the first set I'll open up and then I'll, you know, chip away at it. So there's kind of like a, a, a chipper event based hypertrophy work there. The biggest thing with that is we're just driving, driving metabolites to the muscle group. So all these, whether it's a superset, a drop set, or a, a monster set are techniques to increase the intensity without having to, you know, just add more weight, right? And a lot of times I don't use this as like the only way I train, but I'll train with that stuff, maybe adding a drop set or a burnout set um, at the end of like a workout, right? But I'm I'm not doing it like a ton. I'm not using a workout full of just drop sets galore, right? I feel like that sometimes devalues your main work set. So how I would use them, supersets, I find sometimes I'll like superset like a bicep and a tricep together, just so I can keep moving, right? If I want to work on like 30, 45 second rest intervals, I'm going to do, you know, maybe like a spider curl and then I'll turn around and I'll get some dumbbell inclined skull crusher. So I typically like to complement each other there. Um, and I'm just back and forth. And it's nice because while the best steps are resting on that 30 seconds, I'm doing these, it's just back and forth, right? So it's very workout efficient. I do a lot of this with my clients doing that. And then sometimes I'll even superset like same muscle group. So uh, especially in a hypertrophy program, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll start, um, for example, like, you know, I'll do a, uh, a heavy leg press, maybe like eight to 10 reps. I'll get off and then I'll do like a front foot elevated reverse lunge, right? I'm training the same muscle groups, but what I'm doing is 
Um, you know, I'm moving from like a heavy compound to unilateral, but it could also be just doing that and then getting off the leg press and going to uh, air squat. Um, the biggest thing with that is I'm just I'm just regressing the load demand so I can push a little more reps and a little more muscle fatigue into that muscle versus just stopping the leg press. Now, sometimes my my biggest pet peeve with people who are you know a fan of all this sometimes is they undermine the importance of the first exercise. So in that example, the leg press. If I am doing a superset and my main block is leg press with whatever, an air squat or a reverse lunge in this example, I want to make sure that I'm using, you know, if I'm training eight to 10 reps on a leg press and I'm training hard to failure, I want to make sure I'm not pacing myself. Meaning I don't want to get off that leg press saying, well, I know I had probably one or two in me, but I'm going to save it because I know I have these things coming. That defeats the purpose, right? The purpose is that first piece should be like selling out. And then the extra stuff is just some extra cheddar on top, right? It's not, you know, I'm doing this, but I'm not going to sell out on the first one. And then I'm going to pace myself so I can survive the second, right? Like you shouldn't be able to survive the second. And a lot of times what happens and how it expresses itself is if somebody comes out and, you know, they do 10 on the leg press, then they go and it's the split squat lunge or whatever is easy, or they're just kind of like, they're kind of recovering through that because they still have muscle. It's not enough stress for that movement because they didn't burn themselves out on the leg press or train hard enough on the leg press. It just at that point, you're just kind of suboptimally training both movements. And while it's better than nothing, I would argue maybe you have to get better at just training that leg press to true fatigue and failure before thinking about adding extra stuff. And that's where I see a lot of people slip up when using supersets or monster sets or drop sets. Um, Next question. So uh, Dunlow, um, this is also from YouTube. He says, if I'm 16 and I'm six foot tall, 153 pounds, what is some advice for trying to get bigger while still working out five to six days a week? So a couple of things here, like he says, while still working out five to six days a week, I feel like that's, that's great. Like if you can work out five to six days a week and you're trying to gain mass, boom, like right out of the gates, I, I am a huge fan of like frequency. So if you're training three days a week and it allows you to train, you know, most muscle groups one to two times a week and you're not getting growth, train four or five days a week, train muscle groups twice a week, right? If you're still not getting good growth, then you train up the five to six times a week train most muscle groups two times a week or all muscle groups two times a week at least and then maybe give some extra love to a muscle group for six six weeks or so and train it three times a week and that's what I've had to do in the past with my legs I've done training blocks with my back where I've trained my back three times a week currently I'm training my chest three times a week um, and I'm cycling through that but everything's still getting twice a week and that just comes on a program so if you're doing that right then we look at what are other things you can do well the reality is, you know, you're in this case, 16, you're kind of coming into this beautiful era where you're going to have hormone surging. You're going to, you know, if you haven't done yet, you're going to be hitting puberty and that's going to be all ramping you up, right? At that point, you need to focus on training consistently. You need to focus on getting on a program that allows you to train consistently and train smart instead of just going in and maxing out. And I find a lot of people, you know, I I love going to global gyms because they have machines and I can sometimes just go in there and hammer away. But I'm always floored at, you know, the younger people who are just like lifting heavy, heavy, heavy. And I lift heavy too, but it's like for a different purpose. It's for a sport or there's like, you know, we're just lifting heavy and we're, you know, doing rounded back deadlifts thinking we're blowing up the hamstrings. And instead of like drop the weight down, isolate the hamstring muscle groups. If you're trying to build mass, understand that it's not about lifting and that like two to three, five rep, you know, max out, lift it. That's not how the mass building works, right? You have to think more of like the bodybuilder, you're still lifting heavy, but we wanna really make sure we're prioritizing our form. We wanna work on making sure we're optimizing like our depth and range of motion of certain things. You wanna start to understand the joints, how they move, how a muscle acts on that joint. So for example, you know, if you're doing a squat and you really lean forward and your butt's back and you know, you're barely hitting parallel, and you're not, you know, you're like, why aren't my quads growing? Well, your quads work at the knee. So you need to really get those knees to be bent up, right? Which means you got to be in a more vertical position. 
butt down, sit straight down. And sometimes at six foot, you know, it's not necessarily super tall, but um, maybe you have some issues doing that. You could put, you know, plates under your heels, help you stay upright. Maybe we realize like a back squat might not be that your best machine or exercise to do for quads. And that's where maybe we use, uh, you know, like a hack squat or a leg press with our feet lower on the platform, or maybe some sort of like split squat, um, you know, and then obviously it kind of gets in the weeds there because especially you're beginning and I think a lot of beginners get caught in the weeds because they're just not training. So I think it's finding a good program. Uh, I'm not here to like push my own stuff, but in a way, like the look like you lift program number three, it's a strictly bodybuilding. It's like any, you can do it, you know, any global gym that has like a basic barbell or Smith machine and then some machines. Uh, it's going to deliver six days a week of training. It's going to deliver all your muscle groups should be trained. So I think that's something you should look at, right? Everything comes with videos, uh, you're tracking it, and it's a 10-week period, uh, a program there. So that's something that I would just get it, learn from things like that, and start to really realize like, hey, if I'm doing this bicep machine and I feel great on that one, but I don't feel it on this one, see what you're doing differently, try to make that other one feel better. But personally, I know that there's some exercises that hit differently for me, like a leg press, just hits my quads and blows them up, right? Hack squat blows them up. Front squat sometimes, like I, I like front squat for me. I feel more fatigue in my upper back and torso than I do before my quads. So sometimes it's like if I want bigger quads, I'm just gonna put myself on a machine because I don't want the the torso and you know anterior core strength to limit my quad growth. I'm not saying I don't do front squats. I just understand that. If my purpose is this, then I'm gonna use different things for that, right? If I want just quads and say my, my back sore from hitting back the other day, I'm not gonna put a bunch of weight on my back so that I can sit there and blow my back out on back squats. I'm gonna you know, maybe do some back squats, get some good movement pattern in, build some basic leg strength, but then I'm gonna burn them out in the leg press so I don't have the limiting factor in my back. So that's how I would use uh, you know, different concepts like that. But again, a, a good program should just take that into account. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, next one. And that's kind of piggyback out of that. Uh, Chad from IG asked, what does your programming process look like? Uh, do you have base templates you fill in for clients? Do you use specific software, handwrite things, Google Sheets? So uh, this was probably, I think this was in response to, uh, I made a post on business account, just about individualized programming. Um, so people were asking, you know, what's kind of my philosophy or, you know, how do I, how do I go about writing things? So um, my programming, I guess for me and for my clients comes from a viewpoint of what are the individual needs, right? Now, everybody obviously wants you know, they, they come to me or they come and they're like, yeah, I want to build muscle. I want to gain strength. I want to lose body fat, blah, 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 whatever. That's great. Typically, I start with how many days a week can somebody give me consistently to train? And I'm going to take out like a strictly Olympic weightlifting athlete, right? Because I do a lot of that. And this is, that's kind of a niche thing outside of this, right? But still, how many days a week do they train? If they say they can, they're like, oh, I don't know, three to five, then I'm a, first off, I need to make sure if they say three, they're going to give me at least three, right? Because what I do is I write a program that's based on how many 100% yes, I can train days per week, right? Because if I write a program in mind that I think, you know, Chad, I think Chad's going to go four days a week and I make a upper lower, upper lower split where it trains each muscle group twice a week, which is a bare minimum that I like to train, right? Because I know that that's probably the minimum I'd want to be able to build muscle, um, to be able to deliver stimulus every, you know, 72 hours to 90, whatever, 96 hours, three to four days, I'm delivering new stimulus back to that muscle so I can continue growth. Well, if Chad only shows up twice a week that week and he trains it once, a muscle once uh, a week, and he just says upper lower and that's it, he's going to mess with my results in my program that I wrote for him. So rather I'd be, hey Chad, like if if you can only do two days a week this week, one day a week this week, three days, like the issue is not gonna be his program. The issue is gonna be his ability and consistency to stick with it. So he needs to figure that out first because a program, it could be the best program ever and if he's not consistent, it's the crappiest program. So 
in that case, if he was, you know, oh, well, I think I can really only do two, but I might be able to do three some weeks. Then what I would do is, okay, two, I'm going to go total body. That way I can hit, you know, the, the major movements, right? So I'd have, you know, some form of like a, a knee dominant so I can hit the quad, hip dominant so I can hit the hamstring, some form of like an upper press, upper pull, upper pull, upper press. And then a lot of the, the smaller muscle groups like arms and, and like core direct training, it might not get a whole lot of volume, right? And that's the reality of working out only two days a week, right? I'm not saying you're not going to get it. Obviously, when you do rows and pull-ups, if you're a beginner, you'll probably get some arm growth in that too, but you're not going to you know, have a dedicated arm day because you should be training bigger muscle groups first. Now, if Chad came in and he was doing five days a week, we'd have a whole different story. I'd be writing different splits. I could deliver more volume. I could really uh, isolate more muscle groups based on what his goals are, and that's how that would work. Um, now, uh, Let's assume, like in this one, that was from like if Chad was asking about, you know, programming for himself. Uh, you know, my kind of structure with things, if somebody tells me, again, my premise is I want to train most muscle groups two days a week. I want to make sure that I'm training, when I say most muscle groups, I'm meaning the major ones. So quads is one, hamstring slash glutes two, uh, chest is three, back is four and I'll lump shoulders and arms together, right? Like let's call shoulders and arms might be a bonus. I don't really do, do a whole lot of ab direct training, um, maybe like in warm ups, but most of the training they're doing is gonna be in their big compound lifts, but I might have them do like some basic core work, whether that's just like breathing or this and that. Um, so I wanna train all those kind of movement patterns or muscle groups twice a week. So if they're doing two days a week's workout, they're doing total body. If they're doing three days a week of workout, they're also doing total body, unless it's like two days that are stacked up next to each other. Then what I might do is I might do like say Monday total body and say they work Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday might be an upper, Thursday might be a lower, right? So they're still getting it, that's what I do. If it's a four day, I really like lower, upper, lower, upper. I'm not a big fan of push, pull, push, pull, only because uh, a push, well, technically then, you know, a push, uh, your quads are part of that, right? So maybe doing like a squatting movement um, and then a pull, you know, would be like a, a hamstring. So maybe doing a deadlift movement. Well, a lot of like the hamstring, like if you're squatting and deadlifting, squatting and deadlifting, you're blowing your back apart there's just a lot of wear and tear on like your lower back and hips, right? Because you're basically training it four days a week if, if that's how you're truly doing a push pull. So I will say with that, I will do push pulls if I'm on like a five day split or a six day split ideally, because I would go like push pull and both of those would be like upper push, upper pull, lower, and then I'd repeat that. Um, but again, that's really like a six because I don't want to go push pull, upper, upper, push pull, and then lower for three and then go back to upper and push upper pole and it's on a five day because I'm only training legs once. So if they're doing six, then I would go push pull lower and that's really uh, the only way I would do a push pull kind of split. I'm not a big fan of push pull for a four day uh, because I feel there's a lot of redundancy and just training a lot of the hips and lower back muscles like back to back to back. You're just going to blur yourself out or it's just going to not be your best work. Um, if they're on a five day, again, I like upper, lower, upper, lower. And that like that last fifth day, whether it's an extra, you know, you're doing three lowers or uh, three uppers in that week or in that phase, that's where I would say, okay, if we're training five days a week, we could maybe say, hey, this is a leg. We're training everything, but this six weeks, we're really putting out one more egg in that basket of lower body. Then I would train, you know, that, that fifth session be lower. And then maybe I want to do a more back focus day or back focus six weeks. Then I'd say that a fifth session would be more back focused. So that's kind of how I would how I would program that. Um, all right, next question. Uh, all right, so it says here, uh, how do you manage? Oh, sorry, um, Chris from I from Instagram. How do you manage tracking progress, such as yourself and clients? Do you test weekly do you test the beginning or do you test the end of a cycle so when i'm testing 
right? I guess it's important, like a test is meant to measure some sort of variable. So sometimes the variable is very performance driven, like with my Olympic weightlifters, it's very, does your total go up or does it go down, right? And that's black and white right there. Obviously there's some nuances in between there and we can track some variables throughout that process and use metrics, but most of my clients and even myself, when I'm not in like a competition phase, I kind of break it down into like two subgroups. So the first subgroup is like basic metrics for like newer gym people, right? So maybe new clients, new people walking in the door, um, even maybe people who are experienced, but they're newer to my kind of training program or service um, or just in general. I kind of give myself maybe like a four to eight week kind of period here that I'm just tracking objective and subjective things, right? I know tracking subjective things is difficult because it's not objective data, but I think there's a lot of value in trying to gather or uh, repeatedly gather subjective data. And as long as you can, you know, getting from the same source and taking a lot of things, it can somewhat turn into some realistic or maybe valid data um, in the subjective world. So, uh, for example, beginner people coming in. First off, after you had a conversation of how often they're training, it's going to be uh, workout consistency, and that's just going to be a score of a percentage. Are they, you know, if they're three days a week and we're in the first month, there's four weeks in a month. That's 12 workouts. If they hit 12 out of 12, 100, 12 out of 12, 100 percent. They just got a 100 percent score of that. Like that's a report card score for them. I know if they can give me above 90 percent. Right? And then in that case, it'd be like they can only miss like one session in the month. If they can give me above 90% or maybe also make up some things to where, you know, I might say, okay, if you make this up, it might not be the same unless you come in, but say you're doing an at-home workout and I have to modify your program. That's not like a one-to-one -one thing for me, right? Because it's very hard to replace a lot of the things we do in the gym if somebody do it on their own, but I might give them like some bonus points to bring up that score, right? Like how a teacher would offer some bonus points, right? But for me... Like I strive to be like, give me above 90% for most most people, and that's what we're gonna go with. Now, obviously, if you don't train frequently and you're only training once or twice a week, you really can't miss any sessions, right? Um, and that's like a, a conversation I have with people. Uh, completion of workouts was seven out of ten effort. Seven plus more than seven equal or greater than seven effort. And that's a subjective ranking, right? So at the end of every session, when people have their workouts with me. Uh, through our app is that they, they'll go on and they'll rate on a one to 10 scale. It's very subjective. But I use that data because if, if I see that they're progressing week to week and there are other values and they're saying they're training at a seven, then I still know I'm in a good range. If they're not progressing and they are consistently working out and they're not progressing and I see that they're saying they're at a four, well, they're not pushing themselves hard enough. If they are progressing, they're working out a lot and they're saying they're at a nine, and they're still not progressing, then I have to ask myself, what else is going on? Maybe they think like they're perceiving these workouts as hard, and maybe that's, you know, they're they're kind of they're turning away from it, maybe, you know, or maybe they think it's hard. And I have to realize that maybe their hard level like might be hard for them, but they need to learn how to train harder. So maybe I have to teach them, you know, how hard do we really have to train? Right. And that's a lot of times like people who that's a hard workout, they rack the bar and I'm with them and I go, what are you doing? Like you have five more. Like I know that's what you think is hard, but I'm going to show you we need to be training this hard. This is our new hard scale. And, you know, and that's I'm not saying that people don't train hard. I mean, they train hard for what they think hard is. But the reality of it is sometimes we have to train much harder than we think to get the results we want. So that's kind of another thing that I can do. And that just helps me guide a conversation better with that. Um, and then kind of the last one here, this is a big one I think for newer people, especially in person, because I can see it, um, is like a subjective, like do I notice as a coach that they are more confident or conversational in the gym? Maybe with me, maybe with members, maybe their body language is much more confident, right? Like in the beginning, they're asking me a bunch of like questions, you know, what should I do for this? And, you know, the week two, they come in, they ask the same questions. And I say, hey, like, it's the same as last week here, what it is. And as a coach, in my models, I don't do a lot of hand holding, right? Because my goal here is like, of course, I want clients to stay with me, but I want them to stay with me, not because they feel they can't do it on their own. That's my biggest thing. So I want to teach them, right? I want to lead them to water. I want to teach them how to, how to drink. I want to 
show them where the water is at. And then I want to, because as a coach, I want to progress that relationship, right? I want to get them more advanced, get them so I can continue to, to coach them new things. I'm not there to like hold their hand and be that person forever. I want to, you know, be more of like a, you know, a trainer who can progress clients, tell them why they're doing things. They can grow, they can learn more, and they can feel more confident in their process. So that say if they do have to move or um, something changes and they can't train with me anymore, whatever it is, I've improved that. So my coaching philosophy in that is, am I am I noticing they're becoming more confident? Is their body language changing? Are they you know, walking over and getting the clips? Are they adding the math up on their own bar? Are they tracking on their workouts? Are they able to push their sets? And I'll kind of watch from the corner of the eye. Like, are they stopping short after, you know, last week when I told them they have to push harder? Those are all little things that I can measure progress with beginners. Now, to follow up on this question Chris asked, uh, well, he asked about this, so I broke it down into that. But I'm also going to talk about more regular and advanced lifters. And this is where a lot of like the main things come in, right? And I'm not saying you can't look at those things other, um, but for these people, weight gain, weight loss, all right? So at this point, they're already training consistently. They're giving me solid effort. Then I have to look at, okay, what's nutrition? Are they, are we, are they eating enough to support their training if they're trying to improve performance or, or gain muscle? Or are they eating too much to uh, support their body composition goals? Progress with movements. This is subjective, like especially in like an Olympic weightlifting, right? That's something where I can record and we record from the, the beginning of the program to the end of the program. A lot of that is conversations with them. Like, hey, I'm looking at this hang snatch here. Your knees were more forward. You need to get your knees back more. And it's over the course of weeks and weeks and weeks. And what happens is we can then, if you wanted like data proof, well, we would just look at before and after videos. So having them collect that. I think it's important for them to collect videos like that so that when they leave the session, they can go home and review <clears throat> Excuse me. Go home and review what they're doing. But obviously, you know, that could be with a squat, a lunge. You know, I had a, a client the other day. She's, you know, kind of in between things and, and was, I've never been to a gym on my own in like four years. And you know, I went and it's just crazy. I was doing some walking lunges and I remember when I came here, I could never do walking lunges. You know, her knees would go into valga, she'd be falling over, you know, it'd be her heel would be lifting up. And she was able to walk in lunges her own and that was a huge confidence boost for her. That is like a progress marker for me. Now, can I, did I measure that anyway objectively? I don't know, but like sometimes it doesn't have to be so objective in certain situations. Uh, loading obviously is an easy one. Weight on the weight on the bar, how much you're doing for movement time if you're doing some sort of like a conditioning purposes you know measuring conditioning uh, the time of completion or maybe like the total volume within a certain time um, and the same like on my app i'll get a lot of clients like oh i have a, a volume pr and that basically means like they did you know sets times reps times weight so maybe they did the same amount of weight as last week but did a couple more reps they increased their overall volume so that's another metric so I just like to give people a lot of metrics and I just want to progress in like one of them, right? If I can impress in one of them, I usually know that we're trending in the right direction. Um, and then in terms of like testing, so when somebody comes in, I don't really do a lot of like strength testing, even if they're like a strength athlete, um, because for me, it's like, I, I'm under the assumption that to test your max and to test your top and strength, it's a privilege to do so. And you need to be prepared to do <clears throat> to do that. So if somebody walks in off the street and they want to increase their, their total bench squat deadlift, I might ask them where they've been and I might like, you know, the first session have them work up to maybe like, oh, let's just work up to some heavy doubles here and I'm just going to monitor before form breaks down. But maybe I'm working them up to like 85% because I can tell a lot by how 85% moves, right? And I don't need to see their top end number, Right. Sure, it'd be cool to be like, oh, we increased our max by, you know, 40 pounds on our back squat from week one to week six. Well, you probably had a humongous increase because week one, they were untrained. So was it your programming or was it the fact they just weren't doing anything, right? So I just view that as data noise. And it's also that first week, like, I would rather just get them going into the program, right? Start start putting the work in now, right? We don't run the risk of injuring them straight out of the gates. We also don't run the risk of starting week one. And, uh, you know, I, I always tell my clients it's like a runway, right? So if six, week five or six, I'm, I'm, I want you to, we're going to be testing in week five or six. I don't want to like 
you know, push our, our runway so we're week one, we're already at the end of a runway. We don't leave any room to continue to get closer to that edge, right? Because the closer we get to the edge, it takes more skill. Obviously, it puts a lot more fatigue. And if we got four more weeks and I take you to the edge on week one, and then I'm asking you to, you know, we're going to back it off and now we're going to go four more weeks in. Well, you might have accumulated so much fatigue in that first week that now week two, week three, week four, you're just going to be coming out of a hole. So I'm not a big fan of week ten, week one testing, max testing, unless it's like, yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't do a lot of week one testing. Even when I was working with strength, uh, a strength coach in like colleges and we'd have new athletes coming in, I didn't do a lot of strength testing. I would usually do like a four to six week base block where maybe I'm getting them acclimated, doing a lot of twos and threes and five reps if I'm working for strength work, just quality and just accumulating a lot of like stuff by feel of like in that seven to eight rep uh seven to eight rpe range and if they knew their maxes i would say okay like yo i can deadlift 400 pounds okay like i want you to use 90 percent of that as your in here max right so 360 because it's just a safeguard right sure they probably lifted 400 pounds and their back looked like a cat but uh, I, I'm not worried. I don't want that in here, right? So I, I'd rather be safer than uh, than sorry in that first four to six weeks. And then from there, I can go into my testing and then I can start with that. Um, real quick, we're going to take a, a short sponsor break and then we're going to get back to the rest of the questions. We are into diet and kind of getting our body ready. Uh, maybe a lot of people after the holidays are trying to get back on track with their diet or nutrition Personally, I'm kind of gearing myself ready, trying to you know push a good six to eight weeks here of, of getting you know, leanness, drop some body fat, get ready for spring stress, summer, and just allow myself to really enter that next training phase in a lean state so I can maybe put a little more muscle on for the final stretch before you know sun's out, guns out season happens, at least here in the Midwest. That's where Renaissance periodization comes through. Um, so I'm a big fan of macro-based dieting, right? Kind of a fish your macros. Uh, their app is great. Um, I know a lot of people also like their templates. So you guys can head over to renaissanceperiodization.com. Uh, you can check that out. You can use the code J2FIT. You can save cash on whether it's the app. I know they're running a, a big deal right now. Um, I forget the exact price, but it's something like 40% off or something on their annual price there. Uh, if you buy you know a year's worth of program or uh, the app access. The app's great, I think, for most people like 95% of the people, if you're going to do the work, now it's an app where you you track your food and you know you track your macros and you do that prior to eating. So if you're somebody who eats first and then asks questions later, probably not the best approach for weight loss in general um, or weight gain or you know macro-based body composition goals. Um, so you'd have to kind of re- reverse that. So you know I know you know breakfast, I go down. I know I'm going to have some eggs and oatmeal. It's just a matter how much I can put it in there. It tells me exactly weigh the food out, eat it, boom, move on, checklist it, and it's great. Um, obviously, it's a little difficult if you're eating out a lot, uh, but again, these are all habits. The app doesn't allow for a lot of that. Um, I mean, it has some flexibility, but it doesn't really allow you to kind of deviate from a lot of things because the reality of it is that if you're looking to really optimize your performance and everything, why well, you can do it eating out and this and that, and just sure, you can work around it. If you have an account when I do that, you should really reevaluate uh, is that what you should be doing, right? You shouldn't be, you know, eating out a bunch of processed foods. Uh, you know, that just it's not going to be beneficial long term. So I find having some hyper focus phases, six, eight, twelve weeks where I'm, you know, running that app religiously, committing, you know, doing it fully, instead of trying to say I'm gonna lose weight over twenty weeks and and dragging it out. I'd rather just see what I can accomplish, giving my best effort. So that app and the templates are both great. Um, they also have great reading resources on there if you're looking for nutrition and you want to know more about it. That's with that. Okay, welcome back. We have two more questions here. Both of them actually pertain to books and resources. Um, so uh, let's see here. Sarah said, and Sarah was from YouTube, and this was in response to actually on one of my channels, the Barbell CEO, which I kind of have that, I posted a story. Uh, a video about um, this was way back about like just a basic investing um, you know the power of that and that was more geared towards you know coaches and like the understanding of like hey it's great when you're young we're a strength coach but you know I'm 35 now I've been in this industry for you know like 15 plus years and getting older right like I love it 
but I want to create a lifestyle where I can continue to love this and I don't have to be in the gym like I was in my 20s working 50 sessions a week, you know, um, from 5 a.m., to 10 p.m. I was in the gym. I, I got burnout after like six years, right? It was very lucrative financially. I was able to get myself out of debt. But what, I, what I'm realizing now is creating a structure for my life as a trainer and as a coach, whether that's in person, online, this and that, uh, doing writing on the side, where I can kind of make, make my job and my hours work for my lifestyle that I can have a sustainable you know, um, life Basically, when I start having a family, uh, as I start getting older, right, that I can do this for another 15, 20, 30 years, right? This can be my career. And I think what happens sometimes is we, when we're young as coaches in this industry, or maybe just young people in general, we don't think about that. And so I made a video about just the power of investing. You know, this was like four or five years ago on my other channel. And Stero said, hey, what other questions, or what other books and resources do you have for somebody uh, looking not only to get better as a coach for you know strength and weightlifting, but also uh, you know for other just coaching mindset, and then kind of piggybacking, I kind of put in there uh, my coaching mindset, right? Which is going to also be about not just my mindset, talking with the clients like lose weight, but how can I make give me purpose and give me fulfillment and have a plan for what I'm doing in the gym where it's not just transactional. It allows me to build. Uh, a more financially stable and more financially free life for myself and my family so that I can still be a better coach, right? Because if I have stressors with I'm worried about where money's coming from or I'm, I'm overworked, I'm not going to be a good coach for people. So you have to really take care of yourself for that. And as a coach, especially if you're like a, a contracted coach or if you're somebody who's you know doing your own thing, you don't have like the, the 401k corporations over you kind of just feeding you into that system. Um, which, sure, some people could look at it as bad. I look at it as, well, I have, as a, as a business owner, I have so many other options that I can pursue wealth and pursue freedom. So how you want to look at it, but you do have to do it yourself. So some of the books um, that I like, well, I'll kind of start, like, original question was about weightlifting things, strength sports. So some of the ones, and I'm just kind of rip through them here. Uh, like Catalyst uh, Athletics, Greg Everts makes a lot of, uh, just a lot of good resources there, but... Uh, he, I think he has just the basic Olympic weightlifting manual. It's really good, right? It's um, just goes over like basic concepts of training, basic structure, you know, workouts, um, kind of understanding, you know, common flaws and, and technique issues and kind of how to coach it. Um, not going into like the strict, like the crazy nuances of the lifts, but really just the general the concepts of what you need to nail. Uh, he also has one on ma uh, a master's book. What's on, it's on Catalyst. I'm, I think... I forget who wrote it, Foreman maybe, but it's not from Greg, but it's still it's under the Catalyst hood. Um, it was a master's book, and basically that was you know master's weightlifting, 35 years and older. So I have a lot of clients who are you know older. Um, I'm, I, I'm myself, I'm a master's, right? So it was, I got it when I was 30, uh, five years ago, and it just talks about how training changes a little bit, things you have to be aware of, you know, like regulating volume, uh, accounting for other factors. Um, maybe getting somebody new who wants to learn the sport at 40. I get a lot of clients like that. Um, and just understanding that, you know, when somebody's 18 versus 40, they can still have progress, especially if they're beginners. But yeah, I might just have to wait, you know, they've had 30 or whatever, 22 more years of experience in their life to have injuries, to have uh, other setbacks, maybe to, to have, you know, positives come out of it. So you just have to be aware of that when you're dealing with two different populations there. Um, another one for weightlifting. This is probably one of my favorites. Is I don't know if I have the book on my bookshelf. Actually, I do. So he actually has two. Um, but I'll show you this. So this is from uh, Moss Strength. The guys over at Moss Strength. It's a, a Chinese weightlifting technical mastery and training. But it's an it's an awesome book. I mean, it goes through just you know different grip positions to. Um, you know, physio physiological, psychological training, um, recovery training. I mean, everything under the sun of, uh, you know, um, force velocity curves, uh, everything. Training, dietary. I love these books. Um, I have another one here, the Visual Guide to Technique, um, which basically, this one's really cool. 
Um, goes through everything there about the movements and all the different positions and and everything with clean and different variations. So again, this one, um, the visual guided technique over from mossstrength.com. Um, you can just go to ChineseWaylifting.com and they have their books there. A really great manual there too. And I like that one because it, uh, it did a really good job of, uh, of, you know, laying out the different movements. Another one here, this is something that I just picked up. Uh, it's from Will Fleming. This is more about velocity-based training. So uh, personally, I was doing a lot of velocity-based work. Um, I do that a lot with not only Olympic weightlifters, but I do it a lot with like my athletes, especially younger athletes, where I, uh, or even younger lifters in general, teaching them, right, like going back to the hypertrophy. Like I want them to be moving at certain speeds. If it gets too slow, it's probably too heavy. Um, so this is a cool one. Obviously, you have to have a device that can measure that. So um, I have Rep1. It's a device and a little... Uh, tracker on the ground with a tether and if you've seen my YouTube videos, you know, I've been training with that um, But there's all kinds of different stuff out there, but you know, there's different manuals and he and will uh, Collected a lot of uh, kind of did a lot of the back-end research and put it in a book. So that one's pretty cool um, and then Also, we have some other ones outside of the Olympic weightlifting uh, we have Triphasic by Cal Dietz. That's a really great one. That's over at the Elite FTS. The EliteFTS.com has a lot of great resources and books. So if you go over there, check it out. Anything on there is great. I've read a lot on there. Um, triphasic, really, uh, triphasic training is really good. That's something that I learned a little bit about um, back when I was uh, my college football internship with Bowling Green State University um, under uh, Kenny Goodrich. We think we did a lot of this. I remember we did a lot of research too, or like, readings on mTOR and all that stuff so but triphasic was really cool with that um then some other ones that i liked um and uh, uh, this is on elite fts it's basically old trainer journals training soviet journals that were transcribed uh he like a, he was a coach and and basically it's like soviet manuals from back of like ussr day uh basically programs and systems so it's two different books multi-year weightlifting so it's really cool because this was like for their you know kind of the manuals or concepts they would use running their olympic weightlifting you know four-year blocks for the olympics so it goes you know from you know what's the first year after competition look like second third what are things are hitting how is it progressing that um, so it gives you kind of the program breakdown as a whole manual and it's a big manual and then also the system like the, the principles behind it. So that was a cool one. Another good one for like a beginner looking into weightlifting. And, you know, those ones are a little more in depth, but a good beginner one is Bob DeCano's uh, weightlifting programming book. I have that um, somewhere. I, the master's one's in there. That's, yeah. The master's one I was talking about earlier, that's Matt Foreman. But uh, Bob DeCano, weightlifting programming, um, that's a good one there too. Um, okay, then we have um, for muscle building, hypertrophy concepts. Uh, for like a book or resource for that one. I've read a lot. Like I've read a lot on this stuff. Honestly, I think one of the best books you can read, and this is a newer book, uh, and at this point you probably know I'm, I, I love Renaissance Periodization. Dr. Mike Isretel came out with Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training. Um, that is probably like, it, it's probably one of the best books out there. I feel it from a practical application as well as giving you the sciences and somebody who's you know i've i spent four years in undergrad uh, with exercise science physiology i have a master's degree in it you know from a, from a pretty high level school did a lot of like clinical research in this stuff with both uh you know clinical populations as well as normal gen pop this by far if somebody does not have that background or has a background it speaks to you and i love it because it's super practical um, so go check that out, renaissanceperiodization.com. Again, you can use code J2FIT on that. You can save cash on that. Um, so endurance training, I don't do a whole lot of like running and try training, um, but I remember back when I used to, uh, Power, Speed, and Endurance by Brian McKenzie. And that kind of, he, he's kind of had some bigger trickle over in the CrossFit kind of training world. Uh, so that's a really good book. Um, nutrition, again, I'm biased, but I really like uh, the RP Diet Principles. I forget the name of it, but it's a it's a book they have on there. I think it's called Renaissance Periodization Diet 1.0, 2.0. They have a, a female, a woman's version. 
Um, so that one is another one there. It's a lot of macro-based eating strategies. You know, I've done precision nutrition. I like that. That goes more into like the coaching behind uh, nutrition and behavioral changes. Um, but for me, I, I really want an nitty-gritty of sports nutrition. Um, coaching and mindset. Let's see. Uh, we're kind of ripping through books, I know. And if you, you're not a big reader, sorry. Um, Switch and Made to Stick, both by Dan and Chip Heath, the Heath brothers. Switch and Made to Stick, those are really good. Um, that was books I read earlier on when I started working with clients. Just framing different conversations, right? Like uh, behavior change, um, behavior modeling. Uh, then we have um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now we're kind of getting into like coaching or books I think everybody could benefit from. And sometimes these are, uh, you know, just habits. And, and obviously, it's across the board from health to uh, finance and wealth. But Seven Habits by Stephen Covey. Principles by Ray Dalio. I like that one. Check that one out. Uh, the World's Fittest Book by Ross Ross Edgley. Or Elder, Elderly. The World's Fittest. Basically, um, kind of two sidebars on him. He was... Uh, among all kinds of crazy stuff, like he was the, like he swam around Great Britain, um, took him like, I don't know, like, I think like six months or something, um, swam around Great Britain's, uh, let's see what else, he carried like a log on his back for like a, uh, a marathon, or like carried a log around his back in a triathlon, he, he drug a, like a, a G-Wagon or Land Rover or something, behind him for a full marathon, like some crazy strength and endurance feats. And I was really drawn to it because he's like jacked like Mighty Mouse. Um, but he also does these insane cardiovascular feats. And it kind of re remade me think about, can you do cardio and be jacked and powerful and strong? Um, and he's a sports scientist. But what I really liked was he, he you know has a science, he tracks down the experts in the field, and then he actually uses himself as the subject in his own studies and in his own like anecdotal training. So it was really cool. He's accomplished some crazy, crazy feats. He actually, um, I think it's called Limitless on D Disney Plus. It's on Nat Geo with Chris Hemsworth, uh, the Thor, the guy who played Thor. And he was in there helping him out, do some stuff. I think they, they were uh, training um, Thor, Chris Hemsworth to, uh, to like do like an ice swim in like Finland or Denmark or something. So basically, you know, he was all about that, training him for that and open water. And, and that's a lot of the stuff he had to deal with. So I'm reading a couple of books from him, but the world's fittest book is really good. It, kind of a little bit of bio of him, but then it tells a little bit about his training philosophy. Um, obviously it's an extreme case, but it, it's a cool little read there. Um, you know, a lot of it is just volume, 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 uh, preparing yourself over time and, and just, Pro, over time consistently training uh, but there's some cool stuff on there too um, then we have uh, some more books here these are books now for like like as a coach or as maybe like I'm kind of my own business as uh, you know a provider what I want to do growing up and you know 15 years from now I want to be able to still feel like I want to be in the gym I don't want to be burnt out but I also don't want to have to have the pressure of being in the gym 30 hours a week, uh, you know, getting up at five in the morning to run to the gym and come home. Like, that's not what I want, right? I want to be able to train, leave, have my other things, have family time, have time for myself. I enjoy fishing. I enjoy traveling. I want to create that life. So um, some things there, whether you're a trainer or not, or maybe it's you're a client and you're listening to this, some things that have really impacted me, Simple Path to Wealth. Uh, that's a great one. I think that's by Stephen Covey. Choose FI, so choose FI, it's a financial independence, so FI, that's a great one. Um, both of those, you know, they just talk about like reframing, like you don't need to make six figures to become a millionaire or, uh, you know, retire at uh, 45. You don't have to, you know, like obviously you have to work really hard, but reframing and looking at your finances and, you know, if you can support yourself, you know, by saving for 20 years and now you're in your 40s and, you know, you have X amount and it's generating this much, you, there's a lot of math involved, but it, it's a whole different framework there that what we're taught where we have to work till 65 or or maybe you can go and take a, you know, in your 50s when your kids are growing up and, you know, you, you're just fed up. You don't want to work 80 hours a week. If you've been, you know, preparing for this, maybe you take a pay cut and you go work somewhere else and you have more fulfillment and your health's better and, you know, you're not trading your, your time for your health. Um, so that's, those are there. 
Um, the next couple are retirement. I, I've or not retirement, real estate. I've gotten into that. I see the power of that. Uh, so retire early with real estate, house fire, uh, rich dad, poor dad's a great one. That's just the general great one. Um, forgot the list one here, richest man in Babylon. That's another great one there. I, th- I think that one is a, uh, like the alchemist for me is not necessarily a, a wealth book, but the alchemist is one of my favorite, just kind of short reads out there. I think Richest Man in Babylon is a great book. And I think it's almost like if we had like junior high kids read that book, like that would be huge, right? Richest Man in Babylon is a great book. Uh, Or if you have kids, pick it up for them. Uh, And then last one. um, So Total Money Makeover from Dave Ramsey. That actually played a role early on. Basically, I went to grad school, you know, racked up a bunch of uh, student loans, Lived in New York City, uh, had no job, became a trainer, still had all those loans, still had a high cost of living. Um, and that book, I don't, while I'm not like on the Ramsey bandwagon anymore, because I feel it's a good book to assess your situation, get out of debt, have a plan, make some savings, go from there. I think then some of the teachings I kind of like agree with and disagree with now at this stage of my life. But when I had the student loans, I had the debt. You know, I had to control my spending and, and I was doing it um, kind of growing up and slowly earning more and more. That was a huge book to help me kind of, you know, pay off my student loans early. And, it, you know, it was six figure student loans, um, you know, while living in New York City, while, you know, getting like a job offer after graduating from Ivy League school with a master's to work in like a hospital in New York City for $30,000, right? It just didn't add up, right? So, that's how I kind of started training on the side and it took off and I, you know, and I've, I've been, I've been thankful that I went the training route. I really do enjoy it. Um, so, you know, a lot of people right now I know may be struggling with that type of stuff. So that could be a good helpful book to do that. Um, and then the four hour work week, um, uh, gosh, I forget who wrote that, but yeah, four hour work week, we've all heard of it. Um, basically that one, some of this stuff in there is strategies are a little kind of like, I think at this point it's a little dated. Um, but I think the concept of, of viewing your time as money and, and knowing like how much you are made, like what is your hour worth to you, right? Is you, you know, and if you're doing different things and you're, you know, if you do this task, it's worth X. You know, if say you're training this type of service and you're making X, this type of service, you're making X minus Y you got to try and bring that up. And that's a conversation that I have uh, with myself, um, looking at my time spent. We only have a certain amount of time. So from a coaching perspective, that was helpful for me. Maybe it's helpful for you too, um, you know, in your own business or whatever it is, but those are helpful books that I've also done with that. Um, So I know we kind of went all over on the mailbag today. Uh, A lot of it was yeah, programming, stuff specific for coaching, stuff specific for lifestyle, building muscle for beginners. Uh, what else? Um, you know, advanced training techniques like supersets and drop sets. So I hope you guys found this helpful. Again, I, I really like doing these mailbags because I get to hear from you guys. So if you ever have questions, you can hit me up on Instagram, shoot me an email off the website. Um, you can uh, comment below on YouTube. This is full on YouTube here. Um, or comment if you see a video or something, comment on it. I go through those and I respond to all my videos on YouTube. I'm growing that channel out. I respond with my feedback. Um, so maybe we'll get you on the show here, but we'll be doing some mailbags here. But again, I appreciate you guys uh, tuning in here. Just again, uh, the sponsors here, we had 10,000 in Renaissance Periodization. 10,000 save cash using the Barbell CEO. Renaissance Periodization save cash using J2 Fit. Hope you guys found this helpful. Comment below, subscribe, and uh, leave a positive review. Thanks, and until next time, um, let's get fit, let's get strong. Peace.